Let's talk about modeling covalent compounds. Get out your science notebook. Let's get started. Here's the essential question. How do we model covalent compounds? Let's do a little bit of a review. What the heck is a compound? A compound, as you hopefully recall, is just a substance made from two or more types of elements that are bonded together to make a brand new thing. Here's an example of a compound right here, CH4. This is a molecule made of many elements stuck together. Now, the two types of compounds we are covering in this course are ionic compounds and covalent compounds, made of ionic bonds and covalent bonds, respectively. Now, why do elements form compounds? Let's remind ourselves about that as well. Well, typically, elements follow what we call the octet rule. It's the tendency for atoms to naturally fill their outermost electron orbit. Those electrons on that outer shell are called valence electrons. And it's called the octet rule because, for the most part, Eight is the maximum number of electrons that fill that outermost shell, unless it's the very innermost shell, which is two, typically for hydrogen and helium. Ionic compounds, hopefully you recall, are where metals give their valence electrons and nonmetals take valence electrons to become full. Here's an example of sodium and chlorine, chlorine doing this to make sodium chloride. Sodium gives up its valence electron to become positively charged. Chlorine obtains or receives that valence electron to become negatively charged, and then they're attracted to each other based on those opposing charges. We're going to learn now about covalent compounds. These are only nonmetals that share their valence electrons, and this is typically what that looks like. And we're going to go further into that in these notes. So here's an example of a covalent compound. Can you understand or know how these elements bond? Well, I want to show you a common student misconception, and it relates back to ionic compounds. Some students try to relate ionic compounds to this, and it doesn't work, and let me show you why. Now, you might be thinking, oh, nitrogen is a minus 3 charge, and each of the oxygens has a minus 2 charge. And you write those out, and then, oh no, here's where we see that misconception. Do you see here that all of these negative charges don't cancel out? Well, you might be wondering, what the heck is going on? Well, this relates to a really big student misconception. And the misconception is this, all elements have a charge. That's actually not true. And I, I understand why it's confusing because we typically write charges next to elements on the periodic table. But I want to remind you that the elements do not start off with charges. Typically, metals and nonmetals become charged when forming ionic bonds. That's why we write charges on the periodic table because we want to know what charges those elements can predictively become. But that only happens when they form ionic bonds. So this molecule right here doesn't have those charges. It doesn't need it because this is not an ionic bond. So how do covalent bonds work? If that's a covalent bond, let's talk about that. Covalent bonds typically share electrons. They don't give and take them. And that's because they have high electronegativities. It's been a while since we saw that word. So just a reminder, an electronegativity is just how much electrons are, how much atoms are attracted to electrons. Nonmetals, things on the right side of the periodic table, are very attracted to electrons. They don't want to give up electrons. They want to attain electrons. So they're not willing to give any of them up. So the only way for nonmetals and other nonmetals to work together to create a bond is for them to share electrons. That way they do not have to give any of them up. So therefore, nonmetals and covalent bonds do not become charged when this happens. So let's take an ex let's take a look at an example. Here we have two non-metal elements, hydrogen and nitrogen. Both of them typically do not like to give up their valence electrons. So how do they work together to do that? Well, you might have figured it out. What they're going to do is they're going to share their valence electrons kind of like this. Notice that the electrons kind of overlap in their orbitals and they're double dipping on those two electrons. Well, in this case, hydrogen becomes full. But Remember, hydrogen only needed two valence electrons to become full. Well, what about nitrogen? Nitrogen's not quite full. It doesn't have its octet yet. Well, that's because it needs to find a few more hydrogens to fill up those spots. So this is an example of a covalent compound, NH3. 
This covalent compound, by the way, could be written in a different form. Here is the electron dot structure form, as you see right here. Within this, you can see the bonding electrons that are between the two elements. These are shared between them. And nitrogen has a few non-bonding electrons, these ones that are not shared with the other elements. This type of substance has a bunch of what we call single covalent bonds. Now, a single covalent bond are just two electrons that are bonding electrons shared between atoms. Oftentimes, for simplicity, we write it like this, as you see in the lower left-hand corner, where each of the lines, those single lines, represent two elements. So here is a way we can see how those electrons are being shared. All right, here's another example of a covalent bond. These are between two oxygen elements. Now, this covalent bond, you might notice, is sharing four valence electrons. We call this a double covalent bond, which is a little bit easier to see when it's written in this format. This is how you would write that in a simplistic form. And this is the electron dot structure over here on the right. Can you tell we have an octet in both of them? If you follow these circular rings, you can see that this oxygen has eight and this oxygen has eight because they're double dipping on those four electrons in the middle. All right, we have a single covalent bond, a double covalent bond, and we also have a triple covalent bond. This is where six electrons are shared between atoms. In order for these two nitrogens to bond, they'll share six valence electrons in the middle between the two. And so you can see that here with these double overlapping Venn diagrams. Again, similar to the other two, this is how we would simply write that in textbooks and on paper. This is the simplified form of that. Sometimes with these forms, by the way, it's convenient and nice to add non-bonding electrons just to show where those other electrons are. This model also is a way to show this, but this one doesn't show any of the electrons or the bonding at all. There's a lot of different ways to show the same thing. Okay, so how do we determine whether an a compound, a covalent compound, has single, double, or triple bonds? Well, I want to show you a way to draw covalent dot structures. This, these are kind of the step-by-step -step guides in order for us to do that. So let's see if we can figure it out with that with carbon dioxide here. So carbon dioxide is made of a carbon and two oxygens. And here's what we need to do first. In order to draw the model of it, we need to sum all the valence electrons. So I know looking on the periodic table that carbon has four valence electrons if we draw that Bohr model or the Lewis or the electron dot structure. Oxygen has six valence electrons on its outermost ring. But remember, we have two oxygens in this compound, so I'm going to need two sets of those. So if I add those all up, I have 16 total valence electrons to work with when I make this compound. All right, now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write the symbols and spread them out evenly. I'm also going to make them somewhat symmetric. Notice I put the carbon in between the two oxygens. The more symmetric you can make a molecule, uh, the easier this will be. All right, the next thing I'm going to do, step three, is I'm going to connect all the elements with a single bond. This is where I'm going to start to use my 16 valence electrons. So each of these have to be connected together to make a compound. So let's start with a single bond between the two. All right, so that takes away four of those electrons from our 16. We've got 12 electrons to work with left. Now I'm going to go to the fourth step that says complete any octet. So I'm going to use my 12 valence electrons that I have left over, and I'm just going to start making an octet. Let's start on the left side by adding two, four, and six more electrons over here in oxygen. Oxygen now has an octet. You can see right here it has eight. So now I'm going to go over to the other oxygen and do the same thing. Again, just trying to be somewhat symmetric. So now I have completed and I've used up all of my 12 extra electrons. I have no more electrons I can work with. But if you look at this compound, we're not quite complete. We don't have a full octet for all the elements. Each of the oxygens do. You can see by this Venn diagram here and this Venn diagram, they each have eight. But carbon is only stuck with four. How is carbon going to get its eight? Well, that's where we need to go to step five. This is the if needed step. And I kind of call it the steal from the rich, give to the poor. This is the Robin Hood step. So we can see here that oxygens are each electron rich. Um, they can share some of their electrons with carbon. So we're going to steal in sets of two 
two electrons from oxygen, and we're going to share it with carbon over here. Now, carbon is still not full, so I'm going to need to do this again. I'm going to go to the electron-rich oxygen over here and share it with carbon, which is electron poor. And now we're good. Notice that by doing that, the oxygens didn't become any less rich. They still have all their electrons, all their valence electrons, just some of them are being shared. So oxygen has an octet, carbon has an octet, and the other oxygen has an octet. So this is how we would draw the model or the electron dot structures for the covalent bonds between carbon and two oxygens. This is a double bond. So this model, by the way, again, can be represented in many ways. Here's the chemical formula. Here's the ball and stick model. Maybe you can call this the balloon model. I don't know. We're just kind of missing the sticks in the middle. And then here is another way to show those double bonds. That leads us to the end of our notes. Take a moment to review and highlight key terms, ponder and ask questions, and summarize and answer the essential question. Good luck.